<laughs> We've got uh, Leah Bobbitt, uh, Ed Greenwood, Michelle Cigarra West, and Robert J. Sawyer reading tonight. And our first guest is Leah Bobbitt. Her short fiction has appeared in venues including On Spec, Realms of Fantasy, Shadow Unit, and the upcoming Canadian horror anthology Chilling Tales. And she's been re reprinted in several years' best anthologies. She's also the editor and publisher of Idiomancer Speculative Fiction, one of the longest running genre fiction magazines on the web. You should definitely check that out. And when she's not writing, she preoccupies herself with the urban gardening and gleaning, public space activism, all things 1920s, knitting, silent film hockey, and fabulous hats. It's true. Her first novel will be published by Arthur A. Levine Books in spring 2012, and she is, of course, as is everyone tonight, a BACA alumna. So give, uh, give it up for Leah Bobbitt. I apologize. I'm going to disrespect the podium. <gasps> I don't actually like that. I'm very sorry. It's a beautiful podium. It looks like it should have come in a black pack box and it's extremely professional. Alright, is this good? No, that's not good. Oh, that's better. Thank you. That's good? Yes. Thank you, Brent. Bye. Alright. Um, this is a bit odd because I'm going to read to you from something that you can't have for about a year. Um, Ed's making a sad face. He's like, what? No. This is this is the novel that's coming out from Arthur A. Levine Books, which is an imprint of Scholastic in spring 2012. Um, it's in a close enough to final state at this point. I've gotten through some stuff with my editors, so that this is kind of the first airing of the close to final draft of it. Uh, it's called, at this point it's called Making Safe. There's maybe going to be a discussion about the title, so I don't really want to put that out there yet, but things you may need to know about this. This is a novel about a boy named Matthew who grew up underground and his girlfriend who has bee wings. And the, I'm just going to start just from the beginning and see how far we get. So. The thing you need to know about this is that the underground community in which he grew up is called safe, and everything else that isn't safe is above. Okay. My last supply duty before sanctuary night. I get home and Atticus is waiting. It's half past three already and nobody awake except for Hyde and Mac and Mercy and me, unloading our week's ration of scuffed up bottles and tins into the broad wide kitchen cabinets. Most supply nights, that's all there is to it. The swish and thunk of stacking tins, the slow quiet of faucets stopping, pipes sleeping, water mains humming lower as the city above goes to bed. The air moves slower with everyone laid asleep, gets dustier, goes back to earth. There's a light by the kitchens run off a wire drawn down off the old subway tracks, and the rest is feel your way dark until morning, when Jack Flash lights the lamps with a flick of his littlest finger. Jack's got a good curse. He might have made it above if not for the sparks always jumping out of things to kiss at his knuckles. Me. The only thing good about my curse is that I can still pass. And that's half enough to keep me out of trouble. But tonight, it's not the half I need, because there's Atticus, spindly crab arms folded across his chest, waiting outside my door. His eyes glow dim-shot amber, not bright, so he's not mad then, just annoyed and looking to be mad. The glow is enough to light up the tapestry on my door, the story of safe as far as I know it, in bits of paint and pictures, carved so all safe knows the teller lives here. Atticus blinking makes it flicker like firelight. Atticus's eyes have made grown men cower and run for the sewers. I know, I carved it myself on the bottom sweep. Atticus standing tall and pale armed, claws outstretched, his eyes the brightest red I could scrounge up. But I'm not scared, I'm useful here. Okay, scared, but only a little scared. Up late, I say, stretching the knots out of my arms and pretending I'm not that little scared. There's no reason for that blink glow, that flicker of Atticus's eye. She's got out again, is all he says, and shifts his weight to his other foot. Every ache in my shoulders catches and double knots tight. Oh. 
I can't even get upset anymore. I was upset the first time and the fifth, afraid she'd run into the bad things in the sewers or the tunnels, that she'd make it above and get caught by the men in white coats. Not afraid enough of what scares Atticus, which is the white coats following her back and finding safe. She's run away too many times for me to believe that anymore. She's your responsibility, Atticus says. His claw hands snap until the echo sounds like a hundred running feet, a sure sign he's annoyed. She's sick, I say, faint. I'm not usually one for talking back, but it's half past three and my mouth tastes sour and the ache in my back is a night's bad work. And I know Ariel's my responsibility. I stood up and swore her protection before everyone. I've asked, told, begged her to stop running. Now Atticus's eyes flush red, and I gotta clench both fists to keep from going, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, like a little kid. Tell her, he says, calling me so, instead of Matthew, to say it clear, that I owe him my life, the food in my belly, the tin roof and plank walls and tapestry carved door of my home, my sanctuary. She's your responsibility, and you're responsible to safe to keep safe, to do my best for safe, so there's a place for people like us, always. I know. I'll find, I'll find her, I tell him, and don't meet his eyes. Atticus doesn't have to say, you better find her. I start fast down the footworm path, clenching and unclenching fists to get my body moving again. No time to stop at the kitchen for provisions, but I still have all the other things important for heading out of safe. Matches in my pocket, an unlit brand at my back, and $25 tucked in my shirt. What Atticus calls emergency money, in case you have an emergency, he says. But really, it's if you use it, it had better have been an emergency. Maybe I can sneak a dollar to buy her chocolate. Maybe if I do, it'll make her want to stay. This is the last time Atticus calls after me, his voice dry and hoarse quiet from the things the white coats put down his throat back before there was anywhere like safe. Atticus can't shout anymore, but when you're Atticus, you don't need shouting. People shift in their sleep, rustling like roaches ahead of the sound of his voice. The last time, I think, and shove fists in my pockets where the matches are. Oh, Ariel. All right, I say out loud, and head back up the tunnel that goes above. It's cold above. The first time I went up, I thought it would be warmer, with all that stone and dirt and loose history trapping the cold into safe. Of course, I went up first in the middle of winter, with snow patching the dead lawns and thin, scruffy ice on the sidewalks, and it was colder than anywhere in the whole of the world. I shivered under the beat-up jacket I thought was going to be enough and thought no wonder people were so cruel up here if the wind bit your bones all day and the sky stared you down into nothing with stars. I know about things like winter now, know them as more than a tale, and even still, the cold starts on me the second I leave safe. I keep my hands in my pockets once I open the big barred door and cross the packed bridge into the old sewers. My toes prickle through my shoes and start to scrunch up. I straighten them out and walk faster. It's eight steps, nine steps, ten, before the big door shuts behind me. I carve the big door too, on the inside, not out. Not tails, just faces. On the big doors where we put our martyrs. And outside it, the old sewers. Dead dry and cold. Footsteps echo here, no matter how soft you shoe along the, ed the ledges. The new sewers are louder, warmer, and damp. And I get to the new sewers before I settle my head down to think where the hell my aerial's gone. I don't know above like most of them. Most of them ran from there when they were young, made it down to Atticus and Corner, and made themselves a home. I was born here, the only one till this year, with Heather and Seed's baby yet to come. There's nothing above in my bones. So I can't say if going up was worse for me or better. I don't have the fear like Violet or Scar, who can't bear light even after 20 years and safe. But I've heard all their tales. I spent my first supply run looking over my shoulder for white coats and policemen, watching every sprawled out lump on the sidewalks for a needle, a grin, a knife. I jumped so bad I almost didn't pass, and Whisper had to tell some starer in a suit how I was her little second cousin who'd never seen the city. It was on my second run I found Ariel. She wasn't above. It was on the way back we found her, huddled down in a corner that was halfway fallen in, 
down in the old sewers where most people don't ever get. I wouldn't have seen her except she was shaking just the tiniest bit, vibrating like sharks or bees wing, moving because things that don't move fall to the deepest depths and die. I thought of that bees wing thing before I knew her, I swear. That's how I knew it the first time she changed, that I'd understood somehow that I can make her safe again. So the roster crew got their brands off their backs and lit the matches, because you can't trust things you find in the old sewers, not things whose names you don't know. Whisper nudged me, another test from her, handle it, Matthew, and I crept forward with my own brand to see what I could see. She was curled up small, wearing sweatpants and a dirty white t-shirt that hung loose and smudged to her knees. Her hair was back. I remember her hair, and I think I will until I die. And when I held up the brand to see if she flinched, it sparkled, honey golden, brighter than Atticus's eyes, brighter than matches. She backed up and straightened out a little, and I saw she was, well, a girl. Girls don't make it down here, through the rattly old subway tracks, along the vent that goes to the sewers, past the twist you have to be looking for to find. Not many make it down, period, and even less are pretty girls. And none had ever had those long-fingered hands that tilt to the chin, that spark of light caught in their eyes, their hair, that lit like the first lamp switched on come morning. It's all right, I called back to the supply crew who were shaking and stamping with nerves, and to put her at ease as well. It scared things that bite, scared things cornered. She looked scared, but not like I'd ever seen it. Not like people did scared and safe when they had nightmares about the needles, the white coats. She just watched me, not moving one bit except for the shivering, waiting to see which way I'd move. It's all right, I told her, and tried to smile. It came up bad. She made me nervous with her flower golden hair. We can take you somewhere warm. We picked her up. Her eyes got big when she saw Seed's horns and Hyde's skin with its twisting, spattered colors. And she hugged her big black book so tight against her chest that her arms shook. But she kept herself quiet and didn't squeak or run. And we took her across the packed bridge, through the big door and into the cavern, into safe. We brought her into my house, I'd just got my house then, and settled her down with wash water. And it wasn't until the rest were gone to get Atticus that I found two things. The plastic bracelet on her wrist was the first, scratched up with initials for things only white coats understood. I cut it off with my second best carving knife and picked it up with a rag. It was dirty. White coat things aren't good to touch. The shrunken wings falling out of her back were the second. I was bad. I stared. One of the first rules of safe is not to stare. Not at Violet's twitches or Scar's marks or Chris's apple peeling skin. I turned away quick, but not quick enough. Her face went this ugly, terrible gray. But one of us, I was thinking but all the while, dizzy and strange and trying hard not to smile. She's like us. She can stay. It's all right. We won't hurt you, I said. Yes, you will, she whispered. Her eyes were pupil big with worry. I won't, I told her and put down her wrist. My hand brushed lightly her hand. I swear. She's sick, I told everyone, once they straggled into the common to make counsel. I'm no doctor. I don't know from sick. But I held up the sliced plastic bracelet, and the circle shied from it like it was fire. Sick's the same as freak above. I didn't mention the wings. The ones who'd been in the hospitals heard the screaming and heads banging against walls until the white coats rushed in with needles and straps. They looked at each other in the bitty bit corners of the dark. Atticus crossed his arms and his eyes were dusty sunlight, the color they don't get often. That's the color they get when he cries instead of crying. The light caught her tangled up hair. It sparkled. She scuffed one foot, dragging on the torn rubber and gravel of the common floor. They let her stay. You take your own names here down at safe. Ari couldn't pick one the first week or two, and after that she didn't want to and wouldn't tell us hers. So it was me who named her Ariel, after the girl caught in the tree in Atticus's best-loved bedtime tale. And she answered to it, and she stayed. And after three weeks, her nightmares went quieter, and she got to talking, and would smile here and there at things I said. And morning times, I'd wake up sometimes with her head tucked on my shoulder, 
and all the worrying lines about her mouth unraveled. But I could barely ever, almost never, get her to talk about above. So I don't know above that well. I know the safe houses and the supply drops, the five doors down to the right sewer line to get myself quickly home. But I don't know above like Ariel. I don't know where she might have gone. So I wait. I stand the door between the old tunnels and new sewers like it's my sentry duty, because the new sewers are the most dangerous part. And if she comes back, she shouldn't run them alone. The old tunnel tunnels are different dangerous, Atticus's kind of dangerous. People wander down in the tunnels sometimes, workers or explorers from above who somehow know we're tucked here fighting. But you hear footsteps coming back through the sewers late at night, and who's to know if they're from people living or things not people at all? We find bodies there sometimes, set up to trip over, one hand reaching out of the dirty water to whisper across your ankle as you pass. There are things in the sewers that don't believe in Atticus and safe. There are shadows that watch you there, too still and solid, that don't move the light. Some places are easier if you're a beast. I have a brand. I have 12 matches. I make sure not to pace, and I listen. I don't know how long I wait. Time in the tunnels isn't a set thing, like it isn't safe with its hundreds of clocks, like above with the sun and stars staring down at you, accusing from the sky. I lean against the wall after a while, check the old bricks first for wet or bugs or traps, and think, drift off into the darkness. But the tilt of Ariel's head when she's sleeping, the steady sweep of her hand the day I must up three times, drawing the curve of Beak's sharp chin, and she just said, here, give me that, and sketched it in perfect, four quick lines. The charcoal dark fingerprint she left on my shoulders afterwards. But last time, and the last time I heard those words, and what I might say to make her tell her hurts to me instead of paper. What I might say so she'd stay put for good. So, I don't know how long it is before I hear the footsteps. It takes a second to realize. They're light, quiet, patter quick. I straighten up. I've been half asleep, and that's stupid, dangerous stupid, and squint into the dark. Hello? I call out quiet, knowing a second later that was also stupid, and I shouldn't have said a thing. It echoes. Hello, 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 through the tunnel. And when the echo's gone, I shift my weight one foot to the other, and there's no footsteps no more. Hello, I want to say again, and bite down hard on my tongue, remembering everything Mac and Atticus ever said about traps, tricks, fire, the pale gleam of dead fingers poking up from the water, the way there was so little attached to those fingers when we heaved and pulled them out, and the laughing after coming deep dark from a mouth we couldn't see. There are things in the sewers that don't believe in Atticus is safe. I reach for the brand at my back, and I know you, a voice says too close, thin and dry and too close, and I whip around. The tunnels are always dark, but I know from dark. Right now, they're darker than they ought to be. The outlines of things gone blurred and strange. I put up a hand to my face. My fingers wiggle vague, black on black. The skin around my eyes is tingling, numb. I can't tell if that was just an arm I saw, a sleeve. A face? I can't see. <laughs> You're near a Simha's boy. The voice rustles the hair around my ear, rasped in darkness and the edge of something foul. I strike out at it with both arms flail, hit nothing. You're the teller. Who calls? I squeak too loud and reach out again. Nothing's there. Nothing but air and the slightest breeze, but I can smell somebody now, feel them. The difference between old sewer and old sweat. A flicker of something living and warm. I can't see my arms move, can't see the tracks below. You are the teller then, the voice says, dry, short, bloody. I can't tell if it's girl or boy. And in the other ear, then I'll ask you a tale. <sighs> my breath's coming too fast. I fumble a match, drop it between the twisted old tracks. It skitters into a crack and vanishes forever. Damn. Fumble another and I can hear the catch and hiss as I strike it bright, but I can't see nothing, not a thing. No tails, I manage as it flares and burns out, and my voice rises and cracks like rockfall. Match to the sandpaper, pull once, nothing. Twice, the brand's yanked full off my back, hard enough to pull me stumbling back. I shout, and the echo of it mixes with the clatter of my one good weapon tossed somewhere, away. The voice breathes laughter on my face. What color were Atticus's eyes when he exiled the first beast from safe? The words come hot, dirty. Filth and waste and dead things rotted through, and I can't find it anywhere, not anywhere. Corner, I say, stupid, stalling. 
The name's been forbidden so long it feels like licking mud. It, it was corner he exiled. What color it spits at me, burning on my cheek where I could still feel. Tell her what color. The burning on my cheek shifts, turns into pressure just below my eye and sharpness. A nail, red, I choke out. The pressure falls away, a poke and it's gone. I back up panting, free hand up high to protect my face, thick with panic. All right, tell her, it whispers, whispers like worms. The little breathy laugh that follows is the opposite of real laughing, colder than winter above. Something damp pats my cheek once, twice. Go on home now. I feel it turn, feel the terrible weight of something's attention lift away from every breathing bit of my skin. And then a long-bodied honeybee comes screaming out of the darkness. It stings and stings at the air, buzzes furious figure eights around the tunnel, past my hair, down low to the tracks. That awful voice calls out in terrible surprise, and the feeling rushes back into my face like it's me the match set on fire. I hit the floor, press both hands hard against my face to block out the rush of nerve prickle pain. The buzz gets low, heavy, and that attention suddenly scatters, clatters down the tunnel, little light footsteps that I don't dare and can't bear to see. I blink against it, against the pain, open, slow my eyes. The blurred shape of my skinny fingers, twitching tight, swims in front of me. Oh, thank God, thank God. I don't dare look up until the shapes come clear, until I know that I'm seeing what's there for true. When I finally do, the bee is drifting back towards me, floating, tired. It circles once around my head, tickles my ear, and lands in my outstretched hand. Oh, Ari, I whisper, because she won't let me call her anything sweeter. I close her in my trembling palm, and the stinger hovers, pressed to my lifeline for one long, long moment. And then I open it, and she goes long again, wider, firming up into legs and arms and bone. I open it, and she turns back into a girl with honey-colored hair and eyes that are red from crying, tucked in the skinny circle of my arms. The wings change last. They go long with her and then fall out plucked, fall to the concrete like petals. We used to save them, hang them on the walls until we lived in a hollow that was veiled with glittering wings. We ran out of places to put them after the first three months. Ari runs away a lot. I heard you shouting, she says, and wipes her eyes. Her voice shakes worse than my hands. I can't help it, my arms tighten around her even though I know she's skittish. No, she doesn't like to be held because someone hurt her bad above. So bad she still wakes me up some nights with crying. Came to save me, I say, to cover her stiffening, to talk out what I mean even if I can't show it. I I'm not good with her this way. I don't know the right way to move. What was that? She half shakes me off, trying to sting without a stinger. The wings shudder and bend against the floor, refracting dim tunnel light against the walls. There's a soft crunch as one snaps. Ariel, I say softer, even softer. I hate you. I don't answer. I pet her bloody golden hair until her chest stops heaving with tears. I'll get you a chocolate next time I'm up, or a peach. You'd like a peach, I murmur, rocking her clumsy in my arms that are still learning touching. I'll get you little bee clips for your hair. I don't want, she whispers, hiccuping. But she's not crying anymore. Come home, I ask into her ear, and she finally, eventually, nods. I take her hand, I listen for the footsteps, but it's grave silence all the way home. I always uh, tend to notice certain bits of, of language and things when people are doing their readings and I particularly love, uh, Leah, the, the shadows that watch that don't move with the light, I'm paraphrasing, that was lovely. And I also loved on the big door is where we put our murders. That was terrific. Anyway, another big hand for Leah Bobbitt.